What's going on guys? My name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $850 and for that price you're getting an amazing value with the ability to game at high refresh rates, stream gameplay to sites like Twitch, and even edit videos. Just an example of the performance, this system is able to play COD Warzone at 1080p, medium to high settings with an average well above 100 FPS. This like many other of my PC build videos is going to be a full build guide. That means I'm not only going to be showing you each of the parts and explain why I picked them, but I'm also going to show you how to put this system together step by step, show you all the drivers and BIOS tweaks you need, and finally show you how this PC performs in gaming and in streaming. This system was very easy to put together which makes it great for first time builders. I'm happy to say this video is in partnership with Micro Center who is your one stop shop for all of your work, learn, and game from home needs. They offer by far the best in person experience for buying PC parts. They have a PC builder that allows you to part out a system using items that are in stock and ready to be purchased. What's even cooler is by grabbing the coupon linked below and heading in store you'll be able to get a free 32GB flash drive and 32GB SD card absolutely free and to learn more head to the description below. Also while you're down there you can check out the link to locate a micro center near you and to check out the PC builder. Thanks again to micro center for helping out with this video and now let's get back to the build. This system like I said before offers great performance at the $850 price point. There is a record demand right now for PC parts so the market is kind of weird in terms of pricing and availability but I made sure to pick all high quality parts that perform well and will last you for years to come. So now that you have a base understanding of what the system is let's go ahead and talk about the parts in it starting with the CPU. So there were new Ryzen CPUs just released but as many of you know it's pretty much impossible to get one and they also all retail for over $300 making them a bit out of reach for this budget. Because of all this I opted to go with a third generation Ryzen CPU. CPU. What I went with is the AMD Ryzen 5 3600. This is a 6 core 12 thread CPU running on the Zen 2 architecture. It has a base and boost clock of 3.6 and 4.2 GHz respectively and the cool thing is that it's an unlocked chip meaning you can overclock it for even more performance. 6 cores and 12 threads is great for modern gaming and having that much CPU horsepower is also very advantageous in heavily multi-threaded workloads like streaming and video editing. Now pricing on this guy is a little weird right now. Just a few months ago you could get it for around $190 but at the time of pricing this system out it was at $225 which is still a decent deal but it will hopefully have dropped back down in price by the time you're seeing this video. One other nice thing about Ryzen CPUs like this 3600 is the fact they come with stock coolers free in the box. The Ryzen 5 3600 comes with the Wraith Stealth Cooler. It's pretty basic being pretty much just a hunk of aluminum with a fan attached but it gets the job done and even allows for a mild overclock. I went with this because it works more than okay and didn't cost anything extra meaning we can save money here to spend more in other areas in the build. Moving on to the motherboard this is another area where I went for the absolute most value per dollar I could find. If you've been a viewer of the channel then you've probably seen this board a number of times because it's pretty much my favorite AM4 motherboard of all time. This is the ASRock B450M Pro 4. I got this for around $65 but the normal going rate is $75 to $80 even at that upper price range it provides a ton of value. This board has dual M.2 slots, 4 DIMM slots, great back panel I.O., plenty of PCIe expansion and it doesn't hurt that it has a neutral color scheme meaning it should fit well visually in pretty much any build you put it in. This board is using the B450 chipset and has a decent VRM setup meaning getting a mild overclock out of our 6 core Ryzen 5 CPU is very feasible. Moving on to RAM, this is an area where a good amount of focus need to be placed. This is because having dual channel memory running at fast speeds is imperative for getting the most out of a Ryzen CPU like the one in this build. With this being said, I also need to find a good balance between getting fast RAM and getting RAM that's affordable. What I went with is the 16GB kit of XPG Z1 memory. This is a 2 stick kit of DDR4 RAM running at 3200MHz. This is plenty fast for a PC in this budget and even with 2 sticks installed there will still still be two open RAM slots on our motherboard, meaning upgrading the 32GB in the future will be as easy as popping in two more 8GB RAM sticks. At around $53, this kit offers great price to performance. RAM is really cheap right now, so if you're looking to do more workstation stuff like video editing, spending an extra $40 to $50 for a 32GB kit may not be a bad idea. For storage, I did have to compromise a bit. I did what I normally do for builds like this and got the largest capacity, high quality SSD that would fit 
another budget. What I went with is this Western Digital Blue SM550 NVMe drive with 500 gigabytes of total capacity. This drive comes in the ultra compact M.2 form factor, which means the entire SSD is about the size of a stick of gum. This also means that it takes seconds to install and doesn't require multiple cables the way a traditional SATA SSD would. This drive is using 3D NAND flash and offers sequential read speeds of over 2 gigabytes per second. At around $50, this budget NVMe drive works well and fit into the budget perfectly. Now, 500 gigabytes will be enough for your OS, applications, and a modest games library, but if you find yourself running out of space, you can always spend $50 later down the line and pop in a 2TB mechanical hard drive for mass storage. Let's now go ahead and move on to the graphics card, which is the part that will take this system from a basic computer to a gaming beast. What I went with is the AMD RX 5600 XT. This is the Sapphire Pulse Edition, which offers a dual fan design with a good size heatsink. This card has 6GB of video memory and offers great performance at 1080p and even respectable 1440p performance. This card came in a little under $300 at the time of pricing this out, but if it's out of stock or went way up in price, I'll leave alternative 5600 XT options linked in the description. Now yes, a number of different graphics cards just released, but one, they're all $400 or more, and two, just like the new CPUs, they're impossible to get a hold of. Because of all this, the 5600 XT was a great pick for this build and should serve you well in gaming for years to come. Moving on to the power supply, I knew I wanted to get something with at least 500 watts of power and an 80 plus or greater efficiency. After looking at the options, I went ahead and picked up this ET550 unit for a little under $60. This power supply is made by Silverstone, and as the name implies, it's a 550 watt unit that offers 80 plus bronze efficiency. Silverstone is a reputable manufacturer, and 550 watts is more than enough for this build. One other nice thing about this unit is that it uses all black sleeve cables that have this flat ribbon like design, which which I like a lot. It is non-modular, which is to be expected at this price point, but it's also something that doesn't matter that much because of the case we went with. Speaking of the case, this build is using the NZXT H510, and believe it or not, this is the first time I've used this case. At $70, this isn't the cheapest option on the market, but for that price, you're getting a lot of features and a very clean looking case that can hold all of your components. Like I said, this is my first time building in this case and I finally understand the hype behind it. The H510 provides the best building experience in a 70-ish dollar case I've ever experienced. And while you may think temps would be bad with the closed off front panel, the reality is that temps were fine which you'll be able to see in the benchmarks. This case is very beginner friendly and I was able to get some really clean cable management in around 5 minutes. After building in it, I can highly recommend the H510 for your next PC build. Overall, for $850, you're getting a set of parts that are powerful, reliable, and will last you for years to come. So now that you've seen each of the parts and learned why I picked them, I'm now going to show you how to put everything together. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble the system, but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you'll really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a smaller Phillips head screwdriver for the M.2 screw. I would highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver, this will make building the PC a bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. Next let's talk about static, I personally don't worry about it and have never had any issues or problems with it. If you live in a very dry place or are worried about it, you can use an anti-static ground strap like this one or periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule clear and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. So the first thing you're going to want to do is get out your motherboard box. Go ahead and open it up, take out the M.2 screw, motherboard manual, IO shield, and the wrapped up motherboard itself. Pull the board out of the bag and put the motherboard on top of the box. Now get out your CPU box, pull out the CPU clamshell and the cooler box. You can open up the cooler and CPU clamshell but don't grab either of them out just yet. Take your attention back to the motherboard, go ahead and press down and out and pull up on the CPU retention arm until it's perpendicular with the board. Now grab your CPU handling it only by the edges and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. Once aligned, lower the CPU into place applying no pressure 
sure it should just drop in. Once in, you can lower the lever arm back down, making sure it clips back in. Now, before we can install our cooler, we need to remove these two pieces of plastic by removing these four screws. Just go ahead and take out each screw one by one, then lift the plastic pieces away. Now you can grab your cooler. If you flip it over, you'll be able to see there's thermal paste already applied. Make sure not to touch this because contaminants could hinder cooling performance. Go ahead and lower this into place with the AMD logo facing the back panel I.O. and lining up these screws on the cooler with these standoffs in the back plate. Next, tighten these screws down in a cross pattern a few turns at a time until it's tightened all the way down. Now, if you want the AMD logo facing right side up, you can unscrew these four smaller screws, rotate the fan, and then reinstall those same four screws. Now, grab the CPU fan wire and plug it into the CPU fan connector to the top right of the cooler. The connector and the header have a notch in them. Line these two notches up and press the connector into place. With that done, you have successfully installed your CPU and CPU cooler. This means we can now move on to our RAM. Take out your RAM kit containing your two sticks of RAM and move your attention to the four RAM slots on the motherboard. Open the latches on the second and fourth slot from the CPU socket. Take your first stick and line up the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it into place. Once you're sure it's lowered incorrectly, press down on each side until you hear a click and see the clip close. Now just repeat the same process with the other stick in the fourth slot. With that done, you can now get out your SSD and M.2 screw and bring your attention to the M.2 slot. Take your drive and line the notch in it with the notch in the M.2 slot and insert it at an angle like this. Now hinge it down and use the smaller screwdriver to install the M.2 screw. Once done with this, you can go ahead and put your motherboard to the side and get out your case box. When taking out your case, I recommend lifting the box away from the case instead of trying to lift the case out of the box. With your case out, unscrew these two back panel thumb screws and hinge and pull out the back panel. Next, remove this box from the drive cage which contains all the screws necessary for assembling the PC. Now unscrew the thumb screws for the glass panel and unsecure it like this. I would recommend putting both the panels in the case box to get them out of the way and protect them while you're building your PC. Next, with the case on its side, grab out the I.O. shield that looks like this, orient it like this, and lower it to the I.O. cutout. Once lined up, pop in each corner until it's secure. This can be a little annoying to install, but you should be able to install it fine. Next, we have to change up the standoff configuration. First, grab out the extra standoff and standoff screw extension that looks like this. Use the standoff extension to remove this standoff at the bottom of the case. Now use that standoff you just removed and the extra one that came in the bag to fill these two holes here and here. Again, use the standoff extension to tighten these down. With that done, you can take your motherboard, handling it by the cooler, and lower it into the case at an angle like this, and then hinge it down, aligning the I.O. with the I.O. shield, and making sure you can see the motherboard standoffs through the motherboard holes. Now get out the screw bag from the white box that says 632 flat screws. Now take seven of these and install them in each of the motherboard holes with a standoff beneath it. You can now lift the case back onto its feet. Next, get out the power supply box and pull the unit itself out. Unbundle the wires and pull aside the 24 pin that looks like this, the 8 pin CPU cable that looks like this, and the PCIe cable that looks like this. You can now take the leftover cables and rebundle them up using the same twist cable. This gets them out of the way because we won't be using them for this build. Take your power supply and with the fan facing down, insert it into the case like this and push it to the back, lining up the holes in the case and the PSU. Now take the four screws that came with the power supply or the 632 hexagon screws from the case and install one in each of the holes like this until it's secure. Push the extra cable bundle in like this and we can now start routing cables. First take the 24 pin cable that looks like this and push it through this opening here. Next, take the USB 3 cable and push it through the same opening. Take the HD audio cable and push it through this hole here. Take the F panel cable and push it through this hole here. Unbundle the fan cables and push them through the same hole as the F panel cable went through. Now through that same hole, push through the PCIe power cable. And finally at the top here, push through the 8 pin CPU power cable. You can now put the case back onto its side to start plugging things in. Start by taking the large 24 pin connector and line the notch on the connector and the header and insert it in and press until the clip goes over the latch. Next, just below that, take the USB 3 cable and line the bump out and cut out in the connector and header, then press it into place. 
Now bring your attention to the top left of the case. Next grab the 8 pin CPU cable and line the notch on the connector and the cable up then press it into place just like you did for the 24 pin connector. Now bring your attention to the bottom of the motherboard. This is where we'll install the rest of the cables. At the bottom left locate the HD audio header and take the HD audio cable with the text facing up like this and press it into place. Moving to the right, take the two 3-pin fan cables and plug them into the two fan headers, lining up the notch in the header and connector and pressing them into place, just like you did for the CPU fan cable. Next to the far right of the board, take the F panel connector with the text facing up and press it into the panel 1 header like this. With that done, it's now time to install your graphics card. Start by loosening up this panel like this and slide it up. You can then tighten down one of the screws to keep it from sliding back down. Next, unscrew these two screws and pull away the two PCIe covers, but keep the screws handy. You can now get out your graphics card, but before installing it, push down on the PCIe locking clip like this. Take your graphics card like this and line the notch in the card with the notch in the slot and lower it down. Once you're sure everything is lined up, go ahead and press it down until it's all the way in and the PCIe lock snaps shut. Next, take the two PCIe cover screws from earlier and reinstall them to fully secure the graphics card in place. Next, you can lower down and re-secure the sliding panel from earlier. Finally, the last cable to plug in is the PCIe 8 pin by lining it up like this and pressing it in. With that done, the last thing to do is cable manage all the wires. With the case back on its feet, go ahead and pull any excess cable link to the back and secure it down with the included zip ties. This NZXT case has really good cable management options, but try and make all the cables as flat as possible so the panel will fit back on. You may need to reroute a cable or two if you want things super neat like me, but that's not really necessary. It took me under 5 minutes to get it looking like this, and when done, I just snipped the excess zip tie ends. With that done, you can now install the back panel in the opposite order of how you took it off, and reinstall the glass panel. Also, don't forget to do the always satisfying plastic peel. You have now successfully finished building your PC, but there are still a number of things to do before you can start gaming. The first thing you need to do is install Windows. I'm not going to go over that process in this video for brevity's sake, but it's super simple and I'll leave a link to a video tutorial in the description below on how to install Windows 10. With Windows installed, you can go ahead and open up your browser because it's now time to download and install some drivers. Start by heading to the motherboard page linked in the description, scroll down, click support, click download, then click the global download link for the AMD chipset drivers. Once these are downloaded, open up the folder, double click AMD chipset set, click extract all, and a new finder window will appear. Open up the next folder and again click AMD chipset software. Click yes when this pops up, it will do an initial install then bring up this window. Click install, let it do its thing, then when it's done hit the restart button. Now once back into windows after restarting, head to the AMD drivers page linked below. Scroll down, select graphics, then 5600 series, 5600 series again, then 5600 XT. Then click submit. Click Windows 10 64-bit and then download. Once downloaded, open it up, hit yes when this pops up, click install and it will then load up this new window where you can click install again. Let it install then restart your system again, but after it powers off and as it's powering back on, repeatedly hit the delete key to enter into the BIOS, click over to the OC tweaker then down to the XMP settings, click enter or hit auto and change it to XMP 2.0 profile. With that done, head over to exit then hit save changes and exit. You're now ready to download and enjoy your games. I hope this guide was helpful to some of you out there who want to build this PC or just for anyone wanting to learn how to build a PC in general. With the guide done, it's now time to talk about gaming and streaming performance. First, let's talk about gaming performance starting with COD Warzone at 1080p, medium to high settings. Playing Warzone at these settings on the system resulted in a very smooth 125 FPS average. This was a very enjoyable experience and you could probably get a locked 144 FPS by dropping a few of the settings, but this performance should be fine even for very competitive players. Next let's talk about Rainbow Six Siege. I tested this game at 1080p very high settings using the built in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a very high 314 FPS average. This shows that this system is way more than enough for a game like Rainbow Six. 
Moving on to Fortnite, I test this game at 1080p Pro settings, which is displayed on the screen now and you can pause it to see them in detail. These settings in a Team Rumbles match resulted in the system outputting an average in the mid to low 200s. This was a smooth experience and should be great for competitive Fortnite play. Next up is Apex Legends. I test this game at 1080p with a mix of medium and high settings on the new Olympus map. Doing this resulted in a pretty much locked 144 FPS average with occasional dips into the low 100. With that being said, this was overall a very smooth and enjoyable experience. Finally, I tested two AAA titles, the first being Shadow of the Tomb Raider. In this game, I tested at 1080p high using the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 106 FPS average, which is pretty impressive for a game this demanding. And finally, in Borderlands 3 at 1080p high using the built-in benchmark, the system put out an 81 FPS average, which again is pretty good for this demanding of a game. Now let's talk about streaming performance. I tested both COD Warzone and Borderlands 3 streaming at 1080p, 60fps to Twitch. I set Borderlands 3 to a capped 60fps and COD Warzone to a capped 90fps. Doing this resulted in a very smooth stream on the viewer's end and smooth gaming experience on my end, showing that the system is capable of streaming any game you throw at it. Overall, performance on this guy is great. Pricing is a bit weird right now, but for $850, you're getting a system that can game, stream, and really do most anything you throw at it. Like I said, pricing for PC parts are weird right now, so I'd recommend checking Amazon and Newegg for which site has the best current pricing for each part. And if any parts have any major price spikes or availability issues, I'll link equivalent alternatives down below too. I hope this video was informative or entertaining. These build guides are a lot of work, but if you keep watching them, then I'll keep making them. Them. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more PC and tech related content in the future. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.